right, welcome to the last conversation on the show for the week. And this is coming to still on the cyber space and things that happen there. Cyber bullying is no more news. I mean, a lot of people across the Federation, some even within the Nigerian space recently, have uh, really come out to say they have been bullied uh, within the cyber space. Now, there are laws that guide how you can say things, do things, and relate to people within the cyber space and not for a fall foul of the law. So I want to take a look at this. For those who don't know anything about the act, it actually states that uh, any person or persons who send messages with intent to harass, blackmail, bully, or threaten another individual in such a way that could cause fear of death, violence, and anxiety may be convicted of a jail sentence between five to ten years and a fine could also be applicable between 15 million and 25 million or even both so what to examine this this morning as we have joined us the secretary general of the nigerian guild of editors yabusa wagarin thank you so much uh, yabusa for joining us on the program today thank you very much and good morning Good morning. It's nice to talk. This is our own learned space. When the lawyers call themselves the learned colleagues, you know, uh, this is our own learned space as well. So it's so nice to have you on the show today. Cyberbullying law and journalism, uh, what do they have to do with each other? Well, uh, if you look at the, the global uh, perspective of the issue, uh, there's a growing concern over the cyber crime and um, as of the last time i checked almost about 156 countries have um, adopted that law uh, including nigeria and the rate is very high in europe about 91 percent while african about 87 percent and um, i also checked the check recently uh, the fbi the american federal bureau of intelligence you know, said that uh, by next year, 2025, the cost of cyber crime will be about $10.7 trillion. That is huge. And in Nigeria, the EFCC and NCC also told us recently that in 2023 alone, Nigeria lost about $500 million to cyber criminal. So you can see that there's a growing concern in the global community about the need to tackle the cyber crime. Uh, having said that, I, I, I know very well that uh, that cyber crime is very broad. If you look at uh, that of Nigeria that was uh, adopted in 2015, it's very broad. Talk about uh, terrorism, talk about uh, financial crime, talk about so many things. And uh, as, you, as you are, the EFCC is uh, making move to begin to tackle that issue. I'm sure that is why Recently, the uh, the Office of National Security Advisor also made requests for funds uh, to be able to tackle that issue effectively in Nigeria. But however, I think the, some security forces, especially the Nigerian police, is uh, capitalizing on that law to harass, intimidate uh, journalists. That was not the intention of the law. The intention of the law or the intention of the art was not to use the art to arrest journalists, to detain journalists, and to also attack press freedom. That was not the intention of the law. But unfortunately, in the last few weeks, in the last few months, we've seen the Nigerian police using that ad to intimidate, to harass journalists, and to even detain them. The, the current issue is that of uh, Ojuku, who was arrested uh, on May 1st in Lagos. And as I speak to you now, he's been detained at the federal criminal investigation department in Abuja is been detained. This is almost nine days. The guy has been in detention, you know, and hiding under the cyber, uh, cyber crime law. He's a journalist. I think we should, the federal government or the, the, the lawmakers should find a way to amend that law so that we can strike a balance between fighting cyber crime and protecting press freedom and freedom of expression, including access to information. Because our responsibility is to expose corruption, is to expose uh, some bad behavior within the government, and also to hold public officers accountable. Now, if in the course of doing this, some politicians, some public officers are embarrassed, that is their business. 
So if they have any case against journalists in the course of performing their job, if they think it's a criminal case, what they need to do is to charge him to court so that the person will have opportunity to defend himself in court. But rather than keeping the guy in detention for close to about two weeks. For us, on the part of Nigerian Guild of Editors, that is unacceptable. It is an attempt you know, to, to, to string the, the, the civic space in our country. It's an attempt to attack press freedom, freedom of expression and access to information. And that will surely affect our democratic space. I hope I can get more light on your face. However, as I know you, so I can know, but I wish that our viewers can see you uh, clearly. Uh, Yebusa, now uh, there's no case in that every journalist uh, really wants uh, our colleague released at the moment. But that's not just all about it. Within the confines of what we practice, uh, are the journalists also abreast of the laws that guide what they do, especially in present day term, times, where there are so many laws that are beginning to, um, some would say, regulate what we do, or that would say frustrate what we do? Yeah, I, I, I want to believe that uh, journalists are very familiar with the law. Um, I think, uh, apart from the law, they are also being guided by the code of conduct of journalism practice. And uh, of course, you remember recently the Nigeria Press Council, uh, which uh, comprises uh, the Nigerian Guild of Editors, Nigeria Union of Journalists, the Newspaper Proprietor Association of Nigeria, and Broadcasting Organizations of Nigeria, you know, came together and um, form what they call national ombudsman. The whole idea is that. Um, is uh, if there's any members of the public that has complained uh, against uh, ethical conduct of journalists and they are encouraged to report that uh, person that ed whether editors or reporter to that commission and that commission is is people by eminent journalists and it is headed by the former managing director of the guardian newspaper mr emeka Ezezi. we also have some scholars who, who are in academics who are members of that committee as a matter of fact, we also have the House Committee Chairman on Information, who are also members of that committee, including members of the civil society group. So the whole idea was to avoid these uh, litigations in court that would take uh, many years uh, before you can resolve it. The whole idea was to encourage any members of the public who has a case against journalists to report to that commission in a, so that the commission will speedily deal with the matter. And if the journalists or the media has, or the media has concern is far wanting, there will be sanction. Uh, I am aware that some mem I'm, I'm aware that members of the public are responding to that to that commission, and uh, but unfortunately, some government officials, politicians, to be specific, who feel embarrassed by the, what the media the media are doing, are not uh, utilizing that opportunity. Uh, they like using the Nigerian police to harass and detain journalists, and for us, that is very 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 unfortunate. Now uh, it is on Daniel Ujuku, but I mean, we've had instances of others. As we speak now, uh, where do we stand? Uh, how, what move is the Nigerian Guild of Editors making to ensure his release? Secure his release, by the way. Uh, well, I think, yeah, I, I think uh, we are in touch with the government officials. Um, yesterday, uh, the, um, some members of the, of the civil society organization and some professional journalist group we are the first secretary yesterday to protest his continued detention. And uh, we are getting the assurance uh, from the police force that uh, any moment from now, the guy will be released. And so that uh, if they have a case against him, they can charge him to court so that he will have opportunity to defend himself. But like I said, uh, they are not, in, in most cases, when journalists are arrested, you know, what the security agencies are, are actually interested in is the source of the story. Who, 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 who is the source of that story? Who is uh, the one using journalists, you know, to embarrass public government officials? Of course, you know, as a journalist, um, we are, we are trained, you know, not to, uh, uh, you know, divulge the uh, the identity of the of, of the of the source of information given to us in confidence, even at the point of death. We are trained that even at the point of death, you are not permitted to disclose the source of information given to you in confidence by any source. You know, so that is our training. But of, but but anytime this anytime police or the military arrest a journalist, they are always interested in the source of the story. They are not dapping the story. They are always interested in the source of the story. Now the current matter before the, the police force, I'm talking of the Juku matter, 
Uh, we just learned yesterday that the police are not actually contesting whether the story is true or not. They want to know the source of that story. Of course, there's no journalist, there's no professional journalist that will tell you the source of his story, the source of information given to him in confidence, even at the point of death. That is not going to happen. So uh, we continue to appeal to the government, we continue to appeal to security agencies that they should understand the job of journalists. It is a constitutional duty. As a matter of fact, Section 22 of the 1999 Constitution says, journalists, media house, or media houses shall at all times hold public officer account, account, accountable to the public, I mean to the people, you know. And if you also go further, there's also a provision in that constitution that also recognizes freedom of the press, freedom of expression, you know. So it is not, it's, it, our, our job is not that kind of busybody. It's a constitutional matter. Just like the police or the military or the SSS, you know, um, have the right to protect people, to, 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 I mean, to, I mean, to interfere on issue of national security yeah. and all that. The media also have that constitutional responsibility of holding government accountable to the people, of promoting press freedom, of promoting freedom of expression, and of promoting access to information. All right. So that is our job. So we must have a way we should, we should, we should try as much as possible to strike a balance between fighting cybercrime and, and protecting freedom of the press, All freedom right. of information Thank and you. access to information. I wish we had enough time. I have one more question, but I have to put that across to you uh, when we leave here. And that would be, uh, it's been described that there's a thin line between uh, exercising your freedom of expression of speech under the law and also obeying the laws that guide what you do. So we'll talk about that when we get to around the fora that we discuss. We want to thank you so much, Yabu Sawagere, the Secretary General of Nigerian Guild of Editors. We thank you for being part of the program today.